Welcome back after lunch. What can we learn of, uh, from the life of Queen Christina? Peter England has said that the fact that Queen Christina converted to Catholicism would be as if the daughters of Bush would turn to Islam. Um, in her life, Queen Christina challenged and broke many of the ruling norms in her society. What can we learn from this today? One word that is striking when one read or hear about Christina is power. The positional power of the monarchy she was born to be, but also the way she took actual power, refusing to be only a symbolic monarch. Further, to what she used her power. And finally, the fact that she abdicated from position and power. As a leadership uh, scholar, I can say that there is hardly any research on why people step down from a position. So she's really interesting. So what can we learn from Christina when it comes to power? A second thing that is striking in the story of Queen Christina is, of course, age. Christina was six years old when her father died, 18 when she became a queen, and 27 when she abdicated. In this, she broke norms, having power despite being young. What can we learn of Christina when it comes to power related to age? A third thing that sticks out when it comes to Queen Christina is the gender issue. It seems as she had an ambiguous sexuality. King Christina was biologically female, but was raised and educated as a boy, and in many ways she in her life behaved according to male norms. What can we learn of Queen Christina about power related to gender? Queen Christina is fascinating in the way that she broke several values and norms of her time about many things. In this seminar, we will focus on power, gender, and age. And we also want to translate the lessons we can get from this uh, to today. What are the challenging norms of society that younger gen generations meet today? What ideals did Queen Christina stand for and act out in her way to break these norms? Can young people implement these ideals today? In short, the focus of this seminar is the question, how can the life of Queen Christina inspire us today regarding identifying and breaking norms about power, gender, and age. My name is Lena Lied Falkman. I'm not a management specialist, as it says in the program. I'm a, I have a PhD in social science at Stockholm School of Economics. Uh, and my expertise is in leadership theory um, combined with rhetoric. So both these areas are very marinated with male norms. So Queen Christina is, is absolutely fascinating to me since she was trained both in leadership and in rhetoric, which, which uh, still are male dominated. Uh, I am uh, representing a gender committee and there are more of us here. So I would like you to stand up. Madeleine Sundell here is the chairman. An applaud. <laughs> and then the rest of my, my members. Please stand up so you know they can talk to you afterwards. And we in the committee has invited three panelists to this seminar. So I'm very happy to welcome uh, Birgit Sauer, professor at the Department of Political Science, University of Vienna. And she has been now for a couple of months uh, a visiting researcher at Södertörn University. She has long... <laughs> of course, of course, an applaud. <clears throat> she, um, uh, Birgit has long experience in research on women and politics specifically on, on gender equality policies in comparative perspective and on gender theories of democracy and state. And then we have Stefano Fogelberg Ruta. Okay, you have to applaud now. Yeah? Good. <laughs> Stefano took his PhD in literature in 2008 at Stockholm University with a dissertation Poesins Drottning Cristina of Sverige och de Italienska Akademierna, The Queen of Poetry. During 2012, he's positioned in Paris, uh, continuing to work um, on uh, Queen Christina time. And uh, we're happy that you could come to Sweden for this event. And finally, Erik Pettersson. Good, now you get it, after every person, yeah. Uh, Erik is a PhD student in history from uh, University of Linköping. His thesis concerns care in the early modern state in Sweden, using the veterans' home in Vadstena as an example. Erik has written four books, and one of them about Queen Christina and her way to abdication, called Macht Spelerskan, the player of power, and he, he has uh, put it there uh, in front of him. And I think we'll do like this. Uh, I'll give the panelists 10 minutes each to present their view on our topic, 
And then uh, I have a bunch of questions, and I hope that you have a bunch of questions as well. And we'll uh, talk about power and gender and age this hour. So uh, let's start with Birgit. Come after the lunch break, and um, I'm talking a bit about being a political woman, the ambivalences and the paradoxes, and we have been talking about this um, already this morning. So the aim, um, what I'm going to do, I hope in the next 10 minutes, is to reflect on how we can interpret Queen Christina's life with respect to women and power today. Um, so it's not that really what can we learn, but how can we interpret it? Is that okay, or is it better like that? So we could say modern, modern political world, modern politics is a men's world. The Republican notion of politics since the French Revolution has developed um, as a male-dominated sphere where men play men's games about power, as the French sociologist Pierre Bourdieu put it. Also, democratic politics can be described as masculinist and as androcentric, as an androcratic politics and not as democratic. So more about the sovereignty of men and not the sovereignty of the people. All over the world, women are underrepresented in political decision-making institutions. And also in a country like Sweden, where, for instance, the quantitative representation of women in parliament is rather high, women in politics are still seen as different, and women's issues are not equally represented uh, to the issue of men. So then, which lessons can we draw from Christina's life um, for women in political power today? And of course, we cannot straightforward compare Christina with female politicians today. Um, so our reflections have to be sensitive with respect at least to two dimensions. The first dimension, of course, is the time dimension. So the regency of Queen Christina was rather different from modern politics. Her regency marks, we could see the slow, or we could see the slow transition from medieval ancien regime to modern politics. So we could say that she was at the threshold to um, modern politics. Uh, but anyway, in Christina's time, politics was restricted to a small group of nobles, and the sovereign was not at all responsible or accountable towards the people. So this makes a huge difference to Republican or even to democratic politics. However, um, in the so-called early modernity of the 17th century, uh, new forms of state organization did emerge. And for instance, the Westphalian peace, um, which Christina, Christina was pushing and negotiating, resulted in a total reorganization of state power across Europe. And um, the modern state, the so-called territorial state, um, the Westphalian state, emerged after that. So the second dimension, we have to be careful to interpret uh, Christina um, with respect to modern politics, is the dimension of fictional construction. And we've been talking about this the whole day. But I, however, I want to point out that the biography of Christina has been to a large extent constructed in literature, in gossip, in lampoons, and of course then later in films. So we might not mix the real life with a constructed Christina um, and with all the representations of Christina. Um, however, all these representations somehow feed into the public person of Christina. And so we could also say that these fictions are part of her, you could say, real life. So having said this, what are the important features we could look at um, in Christina's biography for recent debates on women in politics? Um, what we could see is that Christina embodied the transformation of the political field from feudalism, from absolutism to modernity. And of course, then she embodied the role and position of women in this political field. 
In Christina's time, gender was not the most important required characteristics of governing a country. We talked about this uh, this morning also. So it wasn't really a gender issue. Of course, the king was male at that time, and succession rules had to be changed for Christina's regency. However, much more important than gender um, was, of course, the dynastic background, and being of royal descent made Christina a political leader. So gender wasn't that important in politics at that time. However, her biography shows that in the 17th century, gender started to become a political category. And this gendering of the political field, so uh, you could see the, the background, the noble background became more and more unimportant, but gender became more and more important in the political field. And this historical process had its peak, we could say, in the 19th century, when women were excluded from suffrage due to their gender, while at the same time, suffrage was expanded to all men, irrespective of their class background or their positioning. And so it is due to this political moment in history that Christi Christina caused so much gender trouble in politics because she was positioned at this threshold where gender became more and more important for politics. And this is why I think that all biographers have to stress her transgressive behavior. Christina transgressed the ancient times of sovereignty and leadership as a woman. At the same time, she transgressed notion of sex and gender, the sexual and genealogical order, and of course, the state and power order of her time. And her transgressions show that and how modern male-dominated politics developed out of the old absolutist, but of course also male form of politics. And I briefly want to point to four um, of these transgressions. And the first is what I call gender troubles. So Christina was a woman who was aware of power and she wanted to exercise power all of her life. Also, um, she abducted, she wanted to exercise power and she was very aware of it. So at least that's how got her biography. And we also can assume that Christina did not want to fit a female role image of being powerless or being only the object of male power games at the court. So therefore, Christina, was portrayed with monarchic and masculine characteristics. She was confident, she was courageous, she was bold, intelligent, and proud, of course. Attributes of noble and powerful men. Hence, she also had to behave like a man, so she had to acquire a male gender. Like in a nutshell, we can see in Christina's life the precarious and ambivalent positioning and constructions of women in the political field. Women in politics are always transgressing the borders of their gender, and until today, they have to change their traditional gender role and becoming more masculine in order to demonstrate leadership. And femininity still is a sign of weakness in politics. But however, the thing is more complex because it's so paradox. And the paradox is that women in power are criticized for both, for being too masculine and for being too feminine. I don't know if you remember the tears of Hillary Clinton. There was much debate about her tears. Um, there were occasions when the, she didn't cry publicly, so she was criticized for that. And then at another occasion, um, she broke out in tears. And she was criticized for this, for being weak and showing this weakness. So it's a, still a sort of lose-lose situation. And Christina's life tells us that the perception of women in modern politics is a relict of pre-publican, pre-modern age, and that the role of women in politics today still needs to be modernized, one could say. 
So the second issue I want to raise is the struggle over sex. Why did so many fantasies about Christina's sex and body develop? Christina's body became a battlefield for, one could say, hegemonic structures, constructions of a political leader, such a powerful, such a lavish and extravagant sovereign as Christina was doubted to be a real, a biological woman, and these doubts, you can find these doubts all over and all over again. So not only her gender role was contested, but also her sex, her female body, was put into question. Christina was said to be a biological man, or at least intersexual. And while in ancient politics, the king had two bodies, so the king's body was separated, on the one hand, in the natural um, body, the biological body, and the eternal body of the king, so the powerful body. And what we could see is, in the, um, in the person of Christina, that the queen didn't have two bodies, or at least the two bodies were merged and they were not separated. And they were blended and collapsed into one body of Queen Christina. So doubting her sex, doubting her natural body, meant then also to doubt her ability to govern and to exercise power. Christina then was portrayed as the embodiment of sexual difference in power. And this paradox of politics hasn't been solved until today. Still, the body of female politicians is marked as different as the other body that does not fit, while the male body is not marked. It is still seen as normal. Women politicians are still confronted with the paradox of having a female body and a male gender. So the third and the fourth point, I only want to point out very briefly. This is third, the transgression of heterosexuality and of heteronormativity. Um, it was the Christina's transgression, her lesbian relation was at the same time, you could see a dynastic transgression, transgression her obstinate refusal to marry and her lesbian relations were not only personal or private preferences, but they were also an attack on the genealogy of the Vasa dynasty. And it resulted, what could save, when one to uh, stress it, the termination of some her of the dynasty. And also the fourth trans transgression, Christina's conversion to Catholicism, was not, I would say, a private decision, but it was also a political decision because this act fundamentally challenged the foundation of Swedish state power. So she challenged with this conversion um, state power um, in Sweden. So we could see uh, Christina as a female leader who, as a woman, challenged the foundation of power at her time. Or put it differently, she became a symbol for the, um, for the grand, grand transformation of politics at her time. So, and we could say maybe this might be the role of women in politics today, challenging the well-known foundations of political power also in Europe. Thank you. Thank you very much, Birgit. And I, I can not stop from thinking. So it was uh, uh, difficult for her to be, she was accused of being too male. And even today we have this, I think it's called double punishment, damned if you do and damned if you don't in gender theories. Even today, so nothing has happened in 300 years. How long time will it take? Or will it ever happen? We'll come back to that in the discussion. Um, Stefano, welcome. Thank you. Um, me on my side, uh, I will try to focus more on the cultural ide ideals uh, of Christina, trying to suggest that her deep her patronage of the arts, her deep involvement for culture, could possibly stand as an example, even for young people today. Two of the many challenges Queen Christina was confronted with during a lifetime stands out as particularly demanding and both occurred during her youth. 
First, how was she to interpret her role as queen during her 10 years on the throne of Sweden? She was 18th when her reign began, not exceptionally young for the time. Her father had, for instance, been declared major of age at 17th, and so at Charles XI, but of course, still very young. And the second, how was she to establish her position as sovereign queen in Rome, thou not reigning, accorded to her by the Council of the Realm in her act of abdication? Christina solved both these crucial and difficult situations by means of what we today would call, in a very general sense, culture. Her deep interest for learning and the arts, poetry, music, theater, her patronage, and how she employed cultural strategies to solve both political issues. These are aspects of Christina's life that, even if trying not to be too anachronistic in my approach, I believe can still inspire young people of today. As we just heard, Christina's role as young female monarch was during her education uh, and the beginning of her reign, at least, very much influenced by what we could generally define as male discourses introduced by our surrounding. Christina was invited to put aside what were then considered the weaknesses of her sex and encouraged to adopt male behaviors in order to show herself to the world as appropriate for ruling. These aspects are particularly clear in the lavish court ballads performed during a reign. These highly propagandistic spectacles had in Sweden as elsewhere in Europe, and especially in France, just think about Christina's contemporary, Louis XIV. The explicit purpose of conveying political messages under the veil of allegory, and probably uh, Louis XIV's is uh, the uh, most important example, uh, how uh, the image of, uh, when we think of him today, is uh, the Sun King, Le Roi Soleil, and this is very much uh, due to the, uh, to the ballets in which he performed as the son. The image of Christina as a virtuous maiden and monarch was expressed with such consciousness and insistence in the ballet preceding the, be the beginning of a reign in 1644 that there can be no doubt about the propagandistic message behind these performances. These qualities were connected with a clear exhortation to marry in order to give hers to the throne, an invitation clearly put forward by the Council of the Realm. As we all well know, Christina refused this destiny to which she was deemed, and managed to have her cousin and sort of bridegroom, uh, Charles Gustav, elected as a heir. This decision was first discussed in private deliberations, then officially in the Council of the Realm, but found the strongest expression on stage in the ballet performed at the Castel Tre Kronor, where we stand today. Christina's appearance on stage as Diana, the goddess of hunting and chastity, in the ballet Den Fong Ne Cupido, the imprisoned Cupid, defeating the god of love, stood as the clearest possible argument for the queen's refusal of marriage. The ballet served Christina's aim of making believe natural and rational her choice. She appeared in front of a subject, as well as in front of all Europe, as a godlike character, governing by reason and free from the power of passions. Christina appeared thus as an, hero an heroic character, an image that stood close to the arguments used by her surrounding when inviting her to marry it. However, she managed to use the same argument by directing uh, the meaning of the ballet uh, on her advantage. And uh, just a short uh, excursus on uh, heroism and uh, heroic virtue, these uh, uh, completing virtues that Aristoteles talks about in the Nicomachean Ethics, as a virtue pertaining to the most distinguished individual and approaching man to the divine. These kingly ideals was, of course, closely related to nobility 
and is therefore, I'm afraid, not particularly practicable, practicable in general for young people of today. Uh, these were used as a mean to introduce some sort of divi divinization of the queen, legitimizing absolutism and its ideals. Heroic virtue has nonetheless not only an ancient character and context, but found even uh, important religious implications. Christina's heroic character appears in fact as an element of constancy between her Swedish and her Italian time an ideal that had not only to do with military deeds. She would use, in fact, to describe, she would uh, rather better to say that uh, in her academy, the academicians were invited to discuss on heroic matters, uh, to describe her own, uh, Christina's offer of the crown, an heroic offer of the crown for the sake of Catholicism. This is in fact the core of the activity of a Roman academy, Academia Reale, founded in its final form in 1774, which had two main activities, poetry and learned discussions. And obviously, uh, the core of the praise of, the, of Christina was her conversion to Catholicism. But the academy had also the function of a sort of political platform we would say today, for her claims as sovereign queen in the papal city. Not even in this case, I would say, Christina's example as Catholic convert appears to me as generally appealing for younger generations in Sweden and in Europe. Still, the ways in which Christina, through culture, achieved her political aims, or better, the political ambitions pertaining to her cultural patronage, are aspects that I think can inspire us today. Cultural pat patronage was for Christina a way to legitimize her position and power, first as young queen in Sweden, and then as a sovereign monarch, thou not reigning. In other words, if uh, we, uh, I should try to describe it in another way, we could say that through patronage, through culture, Christina actually tried to shape her own world. Of course, uh, uh, patronage uh, is uh, uh, common to many other kingly personalities, and we just mentioned Louis the Fourteenth. But uh, as uh, 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 it was suggested this morning, I would say that patronage uh, found uh, uh, another dimension with Christina, uh, and she stands uh, literally between the patron and uh, the author, I would say. She, uh, the engagement of her cultural interests are so strong that you could say that she's not uh, only supporting uh, cultural uh, activities and events, like we could uh, uh, think about some uh, uh, sponsorship today. Uh, she's really involved in uh, uh, what is uh, occurring around her. Maybe, as suggested before, uh, because she was a woman and in part had to affirm her in different domains than, for instance, the battlefield. She could not, for example, assert her position on the battlefield as her father or cousin, even if she likes to remember his contemporaries and us of the fact that she would have been good in leading the army, and how she regrets greatly to having missed the chance. If compared to politicians nowadays that in time of economic crisis reduce, first of all, expenses for culture, in 17th century Europe, these expenses were regarded as highly necessary. The very same stability of the country depending on the image of the monarchy, uh, of what image the monarchy was able to convey of itself. Though these premises are very different between then and today, politicians, and especially young leaders, that want to mark a difference between them and their predecessors, should nonetheless invest in culture, just as Christina did. This would lead, it is not only a, a question about image, this would lead, as we know, to a more just, competent, and rich society in every aspect. Here lays, in my opinion, 
the actuality of Christina's legacy, even for young generations. The power of culture to change, actually, the reality that surrounds us. And with these words, I stop. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Stefano. And my, my thought is of the education today, where liberal arts and fine arts are losing ground in education. How important this was in forming Christina and what the generations of day actually can lose, the power of shaping their world. Um, thank you very much. Uh, Eric, last one out. He's in his 20s. <laughs> I have to say that. It's, it's, it, but isn't that interesting how uh, he is... Someone in his 20s spent years uh, reading and writing about Christina. I think that's a lesson as well, how fascin fascinating she is. So having uh, opted your age, go ahead. Yes. Uh, do you hear me in this one? Um, yeah, this one's much better. Yeah. Um, when Christina was born on the 8th of December uh, 1626, the world was in many aspects uh, very different from ours today. And that we have to remember, I think. Uh, she was born as daughter of Gustav Adolf, uh, who was the only male member of the Vasa dynasty, or at least uh, the Vasa dynasty in Sweden. Uh, there was a part in um, Poland, as you know. And he was very eager to have an heir to the throne. Uh, his wife, um, Maria Eleonora, uh, had given birth uh, at least one time, as we know. Uh, and uh, she had a daughter then, uh, also called Christina. And she died at only one or two years of age. And uh, she also had um, at least two miscarriages. So um, when it was announced uh, that uh, Maria Eleonora was pregnant once again. Everybody hoped that this was a prince uh, that would give the Vasas an heir to the throne, of course. Um, and at first, when Christina was born, uh, the wom women who took care of her uh, th also thought that this was the case. Christina has written about this event. Of course, she couldn't uh, remember it herself, but uh, she has been uh, uh, taught about this later on. Uh, and uh, Christina wrote that uh, she had a very strong voice um, and that she was covered with hair. And this led the women that uh, took care of her to the false conclusion that she actually was a boy. And um, she also writes, and that, that is very important, I think, that the only person who did not care that she was a girl was her father, Gustav Adolf. Um, and he said from the very beginning on that, he sh uh, that Christina should be raised as a prince, uh, that they should uh, make no difference. And, for example, at a visit in Kalmar in southern parts of Sweden, um, when she was only two years old, uh, he got the question if they should not fire these cannons for a salute uh, when the small princess, Christina, was uh, present. Um, but he only said that uh, she had to learn because she was the daughter of a soldier. Yes, so this was Christina's beginning and first years. And when she was only six years of age, uh, as we all know, her father died in the Battle of Lützen in Germany. And her education, of course, was very forced. And um, a government was uh, formed uh, that should rule the country until she became of age to rule uh, by herself. And the main figure in this government was the chancellor, Axel Oxenstierna. And he wrote a new form of government for Sweden. And he said that this was accepted by the king while he still lived. But we only have Axel Oxenstierna's own word for this. So we don't know actually if this is true. And this was the new foundation for how the kingdom should be ruled. And it contained uh, five noblemen that should rule, rule uh, the king, kingdom uh, until Christina got of age. 
Yes. And uh, for Christina, her childhood was very, of course, uh, dramatic. And she ha has um, written how she fled to the studies from her grieving mother. Uh, uh, the mother was um, in her room all days. Um, and the court didn't have any place for her. Uh, and she had very few others uh, that were her age uh, at the court. Uh, but she had a great teacher. Uh, his name was Johannes Matti, and he was very radical at this time, and he thought that all Christian churches should lay all differences aside. Uh, and he pointed out that the major war uh, that was going on in Germany uh, was a religious one, the Thirty Years' War, as we all know. Uh, and this was due to the religious conflict uh, in So, uh, Christina had this very radical teacher of hers. And she also learned all the things a prince should manage to do, uh, as be able to ride a horse, of course, fight with a sword. And she learned other th uh, stuff like fortification and war strategies. And she learned history. This was as part of her political uh, education. And her uh, ed educator in this field was, uh, of course, no, no one else than Axel Oxenstierna himself. Uh, when Christina was 18, uh, she was pronounced of age to rule uh, on her own. And she had learned from the, this great master. Uh, and the first thing that she didn't do was that she did not sign this form of government that Axel Oxenstierna had written. And this meant that she had almost all power in her own hands um, at only the age of 18. And she, uh, of course, had to listen to what her advisors said, um, but she didn't have to follow uh, what they said if she didn't want to. Uh, soon enough, she realized that she wanted something else than to rule Sweden for the rest of her life. Um, she could got not get married without having to deal with the power struggle of the marriage. Uh, at this point of time in history, the husband was always the leader in uh, the marriage of the couple. And this meant that she would have to step down from the leading role in the marriage. And this was not something that she could accept. Um, her destiny uh, from birth was to rule, so she said also. And of course, this became a major conflict for her as well, uh, being a woman in this um, system that was formed uh, for men. And after just a few years on the throne, she explained her position. Uh, she had a successor pointed out, her cousin, Carl Gustav, as we heard her before. Um, and she said that he could lead Sweden in battle if necessary. And he could also form a new strong dynasty, which she couldn't. Um, and the Vasa dynasty would end with her. Um, and of course, she motivated it with uh, the motive that Sweden needed this man, this male figure, uh, to lead the country. She didn't think that she could manage this role. And also, which is very important, I think, she, managed, uh, she mentioned her own longing for freedom. Uh, and this is uh, a key point, I think, for her, for her own motivation uh, to, uh, to leaving the throne. And what can we learn from this today? I think most of all the importance of education and skilled teachers. Uh, we have, uh, as I pointed out, this Johannes Matti as even in this time, he was very radical. And I think that was uh, very important for Christina. And he gave her much input on how she could live her life. And um, also she uh, had input that she would never have with another teacher. Um, and also I think she learns us that it is very important to follow what you really want at heart. Uh, and not necessarily what you're destined for or what the role that you're born to um, decides for you. Uh, yeah.
thank you for your attention. Thank you, Eric, for the insight in, in Christina's early years and how she was formed. And, and all your presentations create so many what-if questions with me. And I, I know I'm in the, uh, the royal castle, but so excuse me for being blunt, but what if? What if a monarch of today changed their religion to Catholicism? What if a monarch of today um, would be homosexual? What if? <laughs> I, I'm not that familiar with monarchies as um, we long ago lost the tradition, luckily, of monarchies. But we could ask the question, what is if a, if a modern politician um, is homosexual? Mm -hmm. And what, again, we could see, so where I have the cases of uh, Germany and Austria I'm most familiar with, that it's much easier nowadays for male politicians <laughs> to get out of the closet. So in Germany, we have quite a few. Uh, I don't know, I'm not familiar with, the, with other countries. Um, but for women, it's still not that easy to get out of the closet and saying, oh, well, I'm lesbian and I'm a politician in power. Um, and I think this is, this is still interesting also with this um, sexual troubles that, um, of course, you could say, well, it's not that interesting uh, which sexual orientation, for instance, a politician or a monarch has. Um, although it, it gets more and more, um, it gets more and more to the public, so it's not a private issue. That's what I mean with the notion of the two bodies of a of a, a public person or of a politi politician, they get more and more merged or they collapse into um, another. And so what, what I think, it's, it's still interesting that whenever you look what has to do with sex or with gender or with sexual orientation in politics, that we still have the difference between how men are perceived and how women are perceived, so. <laughs> Let's move to the education question. What would happen if Queen Christina would form our education today? Would we have war strategy? Would we have eight languages in school? Would we have liberal arts? <laughs> what would we have? And great teachers, I, I assume. Great teacher, of course. Yeah. And, of course, more languages, I think. And, of course, to speak the languages, that was, was important in her position. Uh, it wasn't to write. She was awful at spelling. For, for instance, she, she she wrote French all her um, uh, life, and yeah, it's not that easy <laughs> to to read today. But um, yeah, uh, and history. I think she was very fond of history. She uh, she always read the uh, Tacitus and the, all the antiques, uh, antique writers and so on. So history and languages, I think she preferred best. Well, uh, the language aspect, of course, uh, then it's, uh, as you say, uh, especially the spoken word, which was important. Christina had, of course, uh, several secretaries writing for her, so she didn't really need to uh, put to, to, to write completely correct in every language she wrote. It was uh, so many, so, but her spoken uh, capacities in all the languages she spoke uh, must have been, uh, well, uh, Chanu says that she speaks of, as if she was, uh, she had been brought up uh, at the Louvre. So, uh, well, there is, of course, uh, an homage and, uh, um, a praise in those words, but we have no doubt to believe uh, they are true, so. So let's go to the, the power issue. What role did this, if we, I know we've been into this many times today, but if you could elaborate, maybe Birgit, on the, the power issue and, and gender and Christina. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, I'd, well, it's difficult to add something what I said before, but maybe I can um, give some more variations. I think if we look at it, we had the discussion this morning um, of symbolizing Europe. So we are also dealing with a question, so what is power in Europe? And um, 
how can we symbolize, I would say, if Europe is a democracy, then we should um, somehow symbolize um, the sovereignty of the people. Um, and uh, then, of course, we have to look um, how did power um, develop. And I think, of course, um, when saying, well, the 17th century um, was the start for um, a rearrangement for restructuring um, power and power relations. And Christina was all within these power troubles, and she was on one hand um, playing with it, playing the power game, and as you said, maybe she was also suffering from it. And I think what you brought in, this notion of freedom, we have to, I think we have to carefully think about it. So what is freedom, for instance, in relation to power? And what did it mean um, also for um, Christina? Couldn't it be the case also that she said, well, um, I have the freedom to exercise power. I'm not familiar as you with her biography, but what I was reading was I had the impression she also thought it's a way um, of freedom to being um, in power. So, but it's always the, the ambivalence. Um, and then I would say if we look then at gender and power today and under European conditions, we really have to carefully look um, what could be the way to, on the one hand, um, democracy, also to equality and freedom. So I think this is, maybe equality wasn't that the question at Christina's time, but I would say this is the question, um, the broader question of gender and politics, of women in politics today. How can we look at equality on the one hand, freedom on the other hand, and, and what is then, uh, what does power at this uh, very special moment then mean? So it's more a question, it's not an answer. Thank you. Do any of you have any questions? Yes. I try to be very positive, but you have the cases of, uh, of daughters of big men, like I said, Uppio and Tidiel Gandhi, and they were both killed and they didn't have the case. Could I have a commentary on this? <laughs> Anyone? Yeah, I, I can try. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know if the killing makes a pattern, but, but what is clear is that, um, that for, for women, they, they were, were trying, uh, political science were trying to make topologies. What are the, the roots, the ways of women, for instance, coming to power? Um, and then you have modern democracies, party democracies, uh, where you could see, well, you have to go into the party and then sometime you go up the ladder and the, then you maybe you're lucky to um, have this, uh, this position. Or you have the other way saying, well, you're coming out of a dynastic tradition. And so the daughters of big men, they have more, took more of this dynastic road. Today we have a third road saying, well, we have quota systems. So, yeah, it's not a sort of meritocracy because meritocracy doesn't work, but aristocracy maybe worked at that time, being a, um, a daughter of a great man. So we, in modern democracies, we have the other, um, we have the other way. And, well, there was also a, a very sad um, case in Sweden um, of killing of female politician, so I wouldn't say that this is the pattern, but it could be, yeah. Yes. You can't hear me. Oh, oh dear. I'm Margit Wallerstein, no, and I'm dealing mostly with European issues. Uh, I'm looking at your book here, Erik Pettersson, The Power Player. You have a subtitle. Why this subtitle? Queen Elizabeth's Revolt. Yes, um, I think, think she revolts against the system, the system uh, built by men mostly, by Axel Oxenstierna, by even her father, uh, and uh, she she doesn't fit this role, I think, and um, um, of course, uh, revolt is 
kind of a strong word to use, but I uh, I use it so that one will be able to see what she really does and how strategic, strategic she is on her way to um, what uh, what she wants. And I especially think that um, the um, um, her not signing this um, uh, form of government is one way of really revolting against the system. So, Eric, what do you think was her drive? What was her motive? She could have stayed just a symbolic monarch. What was her drive to to take power? I, I think it's very diff difficult to see. Of course, it's 300 but, but, years ago, yeah. Uh, but, but, but I think uh, that she wanted this freedom that she could not have in Sweden. Mm. And uh, we had a different uh, climate of thoughts and she wanted uh, another sphere. Uh, culturally, of course, and intellectually. So, and she just could not find that in Sweden at the time. And I think that was the, the drive, the motivation for her personally. Um, and uh, of course, um, also that she could not uh, deal with this gap between her biolog biological side, that she really was a woman. Um, they have uh, actually seen uh, her body in Rome to see if she really was a, uh, yeah yeah uh, and it, it's horrible that they had to do that but but it, it says something about how strong this notion of her not being a real woman is as as you said um so uh, and, and the gap between her biological role and the role of the ruler the king. She was crowned as king of Sweden and of course this was something that she could not uh, deal with in in a proper way uh, as long as she was king. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Um, Ellie Forster from Innsbruck but the question is uh, she was not the only ruler in Europe who was female and of course, this was 100 year, li, years later from Austria, we always think of Maria Theresia, of course. And she also, of course, was crowned as a king of Hungary because it was no other possibility. But she ruled the Austrian lands. On the other hand, of course, she had children, she was married, and her husband was the emperor of the Holy Roman Empire, but he did that. She was the ruler in the Austrian lands. So I don't think it's such a gap. Perhaps it's another situation in Sweden, but uh, throughout Europe there were more female rulers. Uh, of course, and in England we have Queen Elizabeth, and she, she, she was not married and didn't have children of her own, but she had also other ways of dealing with this problem. She said that she was married with the state of England. Um, uh, yeah, of course, but I think it's a question of her personality and the way she was brought up into this system and she was very um, so to speak um, um, I don't know how should I put it um, she obeyed the rules very very much so and uh, she says uh, that it was very important for Sweden to have a male figure. Um, I don't know if uh, Austria was at war during Maria Theresia's time, but she said that one of the main things that she could not do was go to war. And this was a, a, a male thing to do. And yeah, I don't know if that was important for her, maybe. Stefano? Just, just a brief comment. Uh, um, <clears throat> it is important to see, I think, this definite and the important rupture uh, at the time of the abdication, of course. Uh, it is a completely different situation. She lives in Rome and in Italy, but still it is important, I think, even to see the continuity in her life, because Christina uh, keeps being a, a political person in Rome. She's very much involved in the election of the popes. Uh, she uh, retails a political role for herself uh, she tries to uh, settle peace between uh, Spain and France. So uh, 
I would say that uh, she was not retreating uh, in any way. Uh, this was maybe what some parts of Europe expected from her. Uh, she converted. She could have been a nun. She could have. Uh, uh, there were rumors about that that she would uh, move to Madrid and uh, enter a monastery. So uh, this is important, I think, to keep in mind that there is a continuity. The rupture is important. She leaves Sweden. She leaves uh, uh, the reign, but still uh, she keeps uh, being a, a queen all her life, and. Uh, that is an aspect that really characterizes her life. Thank you. One last question. Uh, yes, uh, Stefano, you, you said that she was... Yeah. You said that she was compensating for her regency with putting up a cultural court, which I think is interesting, given that she actually says that the Salic law of the Franks were correct, that women shouldn't rule. And she also said, has a maxim saying that being a woman is the most embarrassing condition you can be in. And women shouldn't rule because they make themselves ridiculous. This is very harsh words, of course, on her own self. I believe they were written after the chances for her to gain absolute power was over, after the Polish election. And, but uh, I think you actually <laughs> answered this by, by saying that the cultural element was something that she compensated uh, for her um, platform with so that she could keep her kingly, uh, spiritual kingly st status. Because also she sought out Anna Maria von Schurman in Utrecht, uh, who had written a book called um, Can a Christian Woman Be Learned? Where this particular problem, uh, can, a, can a woman have a male mind and, uh, and be accepted in a Christian culture? And Anna Maria von Schurman, who knew uh, several languages, including Coptic and Arabic, she was probably the friend of Claude Somes, um, the French scholar who was in Stockholm. Uh, <clears throat> she actually says, a woman can learn anything, take part in all the arts, all the, all the sciences, but she shouldn't combine this with taking a political role. So this is a position that apparently was uh, in, uh, in swing <laughs> among European women at the time, that they, they thought they could develop mentally, but they were very afraid of taking uh, the actual um, power position. It's an interesting transitional uh, position. And I think uh, Christina probably was influenced by this, although mm -hmm. she tried to gain political power, but of course she failed. And maybe Anna Mar she actually met Anna Maria von Schumann, they discussed. And it must have been this book that they, uh, at least one of the topics were uh, concerning this. Thank you. Um, yes, you can, uh, of course, I think uh, <clears throat> it is possible to see uh, Christina's life as a, um, due to the fact that um, after moving to Rome, actually, she builds up this court uh, where culture becomes her, uh, her land, her reign, her uh, sovereign uh, space. So, uh, um, um, and we have uh, notices also uh, some kind of uh, uh, tiring uh, aspect of a uh, um, a reigning here in Sweden, she had this uh, um, uh, this, this illness, um, probably for starting too much, uh, getting up too early in the mornings and uh, uh, studying, and then uh, taking care of the affairs of the state. So uh, I think uh, well, it's difficult to sort out exactly, and probably uh, we can just. Uh, end up with the uh, hypothesis, but uh, uh, I think that the two aspects, politic, uh, the political one and the cultural one, are so intermingled at the time that it is um, almost impossible to divide them. Uh, I don't think we should. It's our way of seeing things today. The, the two were very much the same for them and especially for Christina. This is my opinion. Thank you very much. Um, I think that my takeaway from, from this symposium is when it comes to power and gender and age is that you can uh, argue and fight for, for um, 
uh, for women's rights, for young rights, uh, younger uh, people's rights to vote, for example. But you can also fight for, uh, for power by being uh, young, by being uh, of the wrong gender and uh, uh, having power, getting power and using it instead of just arguing, but by being young and being woman, as Christina did. I want to thank you uh, on behalf of the General Committee, uh, to Denis and to uh, the French Embassy and Cultural Institute that we could have this seminar today. And I also want to thank your participants, Stefano, Eric and Birgot, that you shared your thoughts today. And thank you for being inside, despite that Sweden is actually sunny today. <laughs> so, thank you. Thank you, Lena. Uh, We invite now Elinor for the next speech. Okay, so actually there's not so much to say about Christina and Austria, so the following are a few remarks. We have now talked a lot about Christina's importance for Europe and to pick out one country in particular, so in this case Austria, but it would be interesting to do it also with the other countries, so in this case, it can make sense because Christina officially converted from Protestantism to Catholicism in Innsbruck in 1655, after she had done so in secret in Belgium beforehand. So we can ask if this country, perhaps, has a special memory of Christina, has the place where she converted become a lieu de mémoire, for the city of Innsbruck or for the state of the Tyrol, where Innsbruck is situated, Innsbruck is the capital of the Tyrol, or for the whole of Austria. And Austria, of course, then and now are different things, so it changed very much. We already know that, so one explanation, since Christina intended to go to Rome, the Pope insisted that she converts officially. So she did so on the way to Rome, in one of the first appropriate Catholic cities, that is Innsbruck. Residing in Innsbruck at that time was a branch of the Habsburgs, and that is the family of the Emperor of the Holy Roman Empire. So this is the one who had to answer for the outcome of the Thirty Years' War and the Peace Treaty of Westphalia in 1648, we've already heard about that. And one has, of course, to consider that the Thirty Years' War was more a political than a religious war, even if the different religions were often used as arguments. They finally became confirmed by the peace treaty, but the fact that Sweden, beside France, was one of the big winners of the war and gained influence in the Holy Roman Empire weighed more heavily than the fact that it was a Protestant country. So I, for myself, or from the historical view, I would not stress the fact too much that Christina's conversion was a triumph for the emperor because Sweden remained the major power as it had been before. However, the situation was suitable for exploitation above all by the church, but I think one has to look through propaganda at that time. For the court in Innsbruck, the arrival and stay of Christina in 1655 was first and foremost one thing, and this is a huge event. If one thoroughly reads about the preparations, then one gets the impression that the whole country worked together to make the celebration as grand as possible. Behind that, there was, of course, the enthusiasm of the time to arrange big Baroque festivities, and especially the enthusiasm of the Tyrolean ruler, Archduke Ferdinand Karl. It was a time of strong influence, of strong Italian influence, with a fascination for operas in Innsbruck or throughout Europe. Ferdinand Karl had had two theaters built in the years before, and there were many foreign artists at court. So the conversion of Christina 
in the Chapel Royal, the Hofkirche, was embedded in a whole number of smaller and larger celebrations. Among these, there was, for example, the first performance of the opera La Gia by Pietro Antonio Cesti during Christina's stay. And that is exactly the context in which Christina is remembered most in the history and memories of the Tyrol today. No general historians write about her much, if at all. But for music historians, she and her stay are often mentioned because she was the occasion for this big musical event. If general historians wrote about Christina, she and her stay in Innsbruck had to serve as a means of taking a close look at court life. The preparation, as I said, of the festivities had been a big logistical challenge and had therefore produced a lot of source material, which historians could and can use to describe the court at that time. So Christina herself did not seem very interesting, but almost only the events she triggered with her stay. Only a few years ago, in 2005, a memorial plaque was installed in the Chapel Royal, saying, of course in German, in this church, Queen Christina of Sweden converted officially to the Catholic faith, on the 3rd of November in 1655. But this, so the memorial plaque, happened not because of the initiatives of the city that perhaps wanted to remember a part of its history, nor because of the church that could have used this fact for emphasizing the importance of the Catholic faith. It originally happened because of Swedes who are living in Innsbruck, and especially because of two Swedish city guides. Because Christina's stay in Innsbruck is of course one of the most important things they want to talk about and now also show to Swedish tourists. It was not easy to get approval for this plaque through. Although, as I said, one could think that the city and the church would, church would appreciate this sign of internationality on the one hand and of Catholicism on the other. However, there's another fact to consider. This chapel royal is a special memorial site in Tyrolean history. It was erected in the 16th century as a burial place for Emperor Maximilian I. He himself was a great strategist, strategist of public relations. During his lifetime, he wrote books about his adventures and at the same time, of course, about his greatness. Many buildings in the city of Innsbruck, where he spent much time even after he had become emperor of the Holy Roman Empire, still show this intention to present himself as a great ruler. And he planned his burial place, inspired by the burial places of Burgundy. This was, of course, no coincidence. Maximilian's first marriage was to Maria of Burgundy. These tombs of Philip the Good and Isabella of Bourbon, for example, already had figures accompanying the deceased. And Maximilian now wanted to have 40 cast iron, gilded, taller than head high figures on both sides of his planned sarcophagus. But when he died, there were only a few figures ready, and because the whole venture was very expensive, it finally took about 60 years until his grandson could complete the burial place. Not as monumental as Maximilian had planned. No gold on the figures and only 28 of them but it is still quite impressive. Even if Maximilian himself is not lying there, so it's only a cenotaph, because shortly before he died, he had troubles with his hosts in Innsbruck. His debts to them were so high, resulting from years of not paying the costs for the billeting of his tenants. So he decided not to be buried there. Briefly speaking, this chapel royal is dominated by his 
memorial, filling the whole central nave and a part of the sanctuary. When there were special festive services in history, all the figures held a burning candle in their hands. So we can imagine that this was probably also impressive for Christina when she went into the church in 1655. However, coming back to the question of a memorial, at the beginning of the 19th century, this church got an added memorial in the only remaining space that was left, the entrance area. I do not want to go too much into detail and history, but to understand the status of Christina's memory, memory, a few remarks are necessary. The year of 1809 holds an extraordinary place in Tyrolean history. There was an insurrection against the Bavarian government to whom the Tyrol belonged for a few years during the Napoleonic Wars. There was one leading person, history called him a freedom fighter, very uncritically for a long time, whose importance became greater and greater the longer time went on. So his burial place is also in the chapel royal with a big monument. He was originally shot in Mantua, but later officers exhumed his bones and brought them to Innsbruck. With this, I wanted to show how symbolic this area is, where Christina's memorial plaque has been installed. And therefore, you can hardly see it when you enter the church. It is near the side altar where she converted to the Catholic faith. So it is up to time and to communication as to whether and how Christina will actually be able to challenge the two male persons commemorated here. However, looking a bit further afield at the German-speaking countries, interest in Christina's life was something that did not diminish throughout the centuries. Every now and then, a book or an article about her was published. But of course, the perspective of the writing changed. Writing about her started even during her lifetime, as we know, and continued after her death. It is, I think, really amazing that this interest in her never really ceased. It seemed very strong in the 17th and 18th centuries, but did not stop during the 19th and 20th centuries. We've already heard a lot about the controversial views held of her, they change between admiring her for her interest in philosophy and sciences on the one hand and declaring her as unfeminine and unable to rule on the other hand. Almost all the publications are based on original documents that are not only referred to, but historians reprinted them page after page. And of course, this is convincing and seems to be the reality. So with this range of impressions, it was always very easy to select the one thing that just fitted for a certain context. Also, the women's movement around 1900 in Vienna made reference to her. As in Germany too, and probably in other countries, the women's movement in Austria was divided into different groups. Catholic women, perhaps, could have appreciated the conversion of Christina, but never her self-determined life. And also the middle class women's movement, women's movement had troubles dealing with Christina. On the one hand, Christina could have been a good role model for them, a woman who was queen, an important person, who had a very good education and mixed with famous philosophers, but she did not fit into the norms of womanhood. This part of the women's movement was fighting for more rights in employment, law, and especially suffrage. But they did not appreciate women who revolted against the traditional role of women. So, the only, so only the social democratic women's movement remained. 
There was one article written by a social democratic woman about Christina in the Neue Freie Presse, an important daily newspaper at that time, but not until 1926. So this date was the 300th anniversary of Christina's birthday. And at that time, when the blossoming of the women's movement was already mostly over, and so in the article, Christina is outlined as an interesting woman, but it emphasizes that the wrong education was responsible for Christina's strange life. This emphasis on education, of course, is typical of that time. So in summary, normally a person is suitable to be considered a hero if one does not know much about him or her because then there are many blank spaces to fill with the necessary or wanted values. In Christina's case, there seems to be very much we know at first sight. But when we look again, we do not know much very in detail. And this uncertainty, combined of course with her glittering life, makes her suitable for different, almost arbitrary interpretations. So from my point of view, it's important, very important, to recount her history as completely as possible and to embed her history in the historical context and not to single out some aspects. Otherwise, the arbitrary misinterpretations will go on and on. Thank you. Any question? I think you pointed out a very important issue, namely that there hasn't been written a really good historiography of Queen Christina due to the fact probably that she's a Swede in Italy, a Roman citizen, uh, with Swedish uh, historians following her far away from uh, the, the, the archives in Rome and so on. Uh, which means that there is no national authority that can s somehow under underline or underscribe uh, such a, a full biography yet. But this is something for the future. And also the historiographic uh, aspect is very important, how she has been seen throughout the years. And you pointed out that in Austria, uh, the, the, the various... Um, aspects of Christina that could be latched onto uh, differ from various groups and I think this will probably be the case even in the future that different groups see different things in her and this is of course uh, an asset in many ways if the full story can be laid out but I, I, I believe it has to do with something with, with her, her mobility there is no clear um, um, institution that has responsibility for her, not even in Sweden, mm -hmm. because she's so far away. Yeah, uh, thank you very much for underlining this. And so that's therefore I appreciate your work. I haven't read it, but you are combining the looking into the Italian sources and the Swedish sources. And this is highly necessary because, of course, we all know that it's so necessary to look very critically at the source material because uh, I think Eric uh, mentioned that she herself wrote about her being a child with all this hair. If there are no other source material, of course she was constructing uh, her own personality. And so I think it, it's all running through the fingers, if, yeah, dealing with the source oh, material. So, thank you. I just wanted to thank you as well as uh, Susanna did uh, for uh, you pointed out, uh, I think, a feature that, that is uh, really important to take, uh, to bear in mind, that uh, probably uh, these uh, different Christinas we have, they are obviously, uh, naturally, a consequence of her own uh, acting during her lifetime, but also to the fact that, as Susanna said, she's been moving through the countries, and uh, mm, uh, the problem also is that uh, uh, there seems to be these blank spaces, as you said, that are open for 
uh, different interpretations. And the, that is why it's so important, as you said, well, it, this is just most a comment to what you said, but it is really important to uh, look at the sources, to try to be as accurate as possible, and uh, uh, not uh, to take up the challenge she gives us mm -hmm. as scholars, to follow her route, to uh, follow her different languages, to follow her different uh, interests. I mean, uh, uh, my, I've been writing about poetry, but I suddenly discovered that I should at least have uh, uh, some kind of knowledge in alchemy, just to give, a, a, uh, and that is not easy. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not easy to have an idea of w what it is about. So th that is a challenge, but if you uh, try to follow a path, uh, a lot is uh, given in reward, because then uh, what really opens is a, um, a really universalistic approach to culture, where uh, she still, uh, uh, and I think uh, probably me and Susanna, we agree on that, I hope, uh, that she maybe looks more uh, back in town, in time than further on. She's a, um, a, a true Renaissance uh, patron of the arts, uh, taking into consideration uh, classical languages, modern languages, poetry, uh, art, music, and uh, at the same time practicing. Uh, well, not all of them, of course, but uh, as we heard this morning, at least trying to write and uh, trying to express herself in an artistic manner. Well, it wasn't really a question, just mm -hmm. a comment. But <laughs> yeah, thank you for that. Any question? We uh, musicians, uh, we create international societies and that's a good tool for many things. So why don't we create a Queen Christina Society, international society? Now, with internet, it's so easy to have an internet society. We can all have our addresses and we can speak daily about so many things. We must come together around Queen Christina. And of course, my aim is to force you to assist us into recreating those terribly fascinating ballet de cour, which are the illustration of what life was in those days. I, I wrote a wonderful article in our deceased uh, review, Artus, about this. And I quoted Baldassare Castiglioni, Il Cortegiano in 1528, when he said that it was obvious that all people needed to be able to dance. And this is what sort of characterized society in those days. Those who couldn't dance couldn't go to a fine society. It was part of the education. We have lost so much in education, we know. And we musicians, we know now how to perform the music exactly the way it was done in those days. We are looking for choreographers who could do the same thing. We have big books on how to dance and so on. So a Christina society would bring us together next time and we should have a Freds Arvel ballet performance <laughs> of leading people. Heartily welcome. <laughs> Thank you for this wonderful idea. So, you have a question? No, in this case, Elinor, thank you very much. It was very interesting to know something about Christine in Austria. And uh, thank you. It was a very nice day. I hope for you too, thank you to everybody, to all the participants, to the public, and uh, I wish you a good uh, weekend. Goodbye. <laughs>